Hi everybody, this is Dr. Matthew Wheaton from Alicia Pet Care Center. I am coming to you today to discuss uh, allergies in dogs and this is a very important topic because really for most veterinarians across the country it's half of our day every day. Um, this is our major problem in our dog population in the U.S. and I'm here to help you sort through it and give you some information that will really assist you in making your pet feel better and seeing the symptoms before they really kind of escalate to a point of a bigger challenge. So where we start with this is a discussion about just the normal expectation for the normal dog. There is no normal amount of itchiness. You know, if we were living back 20 years ago um, where we didn't really have very good flea control, the expectation there would be that your dog would be some degree itchy because pretty much everybody had fleas on them. A lot of dogs are allergic to fleas and so the general population of dogs just had an increased baseline of itch. But that's not really the same anymore whether you're using flea control or not your neighbors frequently are and so the flea population has significantly diminished over time in most of the United States. Um, so we can benefit from that but it also clarifies things quite a bit because we just really do not have an ongoing issue that is going to alter the baseline of itch. And so no normal expected amount of itchiness. Everything that your dog does to him or herself is also something that you should interpret as itch. Um, so there is no, uh, she's grooming herself like a cat. She's very fastidious about being clean. So she licks her paws after she comes in from outside because she knows that they're dirty. She's obsessive compulsive. She's self-soothing or bored. None of those are realistic explanations for the itch behavior that you might be seeing in your dog. I'll get into more of the specifics of what that might look like here in just a few minutes. In the meantime, <laughs> I'm gonna pick up our very loving cat that we have in here who's rubbing up against my legs. So just take the opportunity to give her some love. Um, we are in the cat room, of course, because we're doing one of these talks, but this kitty is too cute to not hug. Anyways. We then go to human confusion points. So we are just connect the dot reasoners. As people, we work with the world that we think that we understand to explain the world that we don't understand. And frequently in this situation, because we just don't have a whole lot of this same allergy in people, it can be really confusing and we kind of morph our, our human allergy issues over to the, the dogs. So uh, first one is um, hay fever. So that's our common human allergy. If your friend says that they're suffering with their allergies, you understand that that means that they're sneezing, um, stuffy nose, um, sinus pressure, all those kind of things. Um, that is not what this allergy is, has nothing to do with that. That allergy on the human side is a superficial allergy, the upper airways, and it's histamine based. So antihistamines work really well to manage that issue. The problem that we deal with in dogs is not the same and there really is no relationship, no strong relationship to histamine. So antihistamines routinely do not work. There's been several studies now that have proven this point, but we all you know, kind of went through our process um, in our learning with veterinary medicine and um, realizing that it just doesn't work. We've got about an 11% improvement is kind of like the best study that we've seen with antihistamines in dogs. So that's well below um, the normal expected amount with just a placebo or a sugar pill would be about 30%. So anyways, antihistamines are not something that we typically use. And if your dog does have any degree of watery uh, eyes, um, sneezing, nasal discharge, any of that kind of stuff, it really is separate from the skin allergy that we're talking about. Not really an overlap there. Second thing is contact hypersensitivity. So um, as people were really prone to this, we have very sensitive skin. Um, as an example, we brush up against a bush, we get a rash, we put a lotion on to fix the rash, we break out from the lotion, we have to put a cream on to fix the lotion rash. It's just kind of the way that we are as people. We have this sensitive skin layer. Dogs do not have that. Um, they are very resi resilient and um, resistant to having a contact hypersensitivity reaction. So it's not about them touching the item and then reacting to it because of a physical touch situation. Um, that's just really not the case and we don't have that really at all in dogs actually. Um, the third issue is food and food becomes uh, you know a little bit of a complicated issue here. Um, food does play a role in our immune system's reaction to things and um, our overall inflammatory bucket is definitely influenced by food. 
We do certainly have this on the human side. I actually have a, a daughter that has some scalp eczema that's very responsive to her being on the right diet and when she goes off of it, you know, her problems relapse. Um, but all of us kind of know somebody that has some sensitivity to food, so it's really easy for us to go down this path. It's obviously something that each dog is getting every single day, so it's a pretty easy scapegoat for you know blame on what is going on. There's a lot of talk out there about dogs having chicken allergies and things like that. Uh, bottom line is we, we have a very small amount of dogs that actually have a true food allergy. A true food allergy would be that there's a protein source hypersensitivity that's happening in the gut. So the individual dog is taking in whatever protein that they're eating, beef, chicken, lamb, et cetera, and they're mounting an inflammatory response to that protein in their intestinal tract, then that inflammation kind of goes throughout their body and causes their symptoms. Uh, that's thought to be somewhere in the three to 5% of all allergic dogs. Um, occasionally we'll hear something higher from a dermatologist, and I've also been to lectures with dermatologists that have been practicing for over 30 years that don't really think that food allergy exists. Suffice it to say that it's a relatively low risk um, it is certainly possible and it's a relatively easy conversation for us to button up here. If you want to play out the possibility of your dog having a food allergy, it's relatively simple for what you need to do. It's simple and complicated at the same time because it does require it to be done properly, but you wanna do a food trial. A food trial in this situation, um, unless you're using a prescription diet, which we can certainly um, help you with, a hydrolyzed protein diet or something like that, um, you could choose a new protein source, a novel protein source diet is kind of the, the typical food trial that we would do. And so if your dog was eating chicken, beef, or lamb before, at any uh, time during their life, and any amount, and those are, let's just say for this example, those are the three protein sources that your dog had ever eaten, then you're gonna do something different from that for a three month period of time. You're gonna wean over to this new food that's gonna be bison, venison, duck, something like that. It doesn't really matter what the protein source is. Um, sea cucumber or alien would work too, but it doesn't really matter. You're just seeing something new that your dog has never seen before, and you need during that time to avoid all the previously fed protein sources. In that situation then, you're tricking the dog's gut to not continue the cycle of inflammation because you're no longer giving it the protein source that the gut is primed to attack and you're tricking that gut to no longer have that inflammation and the lack of inflammation is going to spill over to the rest of the body in a positive way and the allergies are gonna miraculously go away and at the end of the three month period of time, you are gonna say, this is way better, this is so much better, I'm never changing the food again because I've solved my dog's problem. That is really, really important that you not go back to the previous food unless you really wanna prove the point. Um, we would say in our practice, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So. You know, if you get the resolution, stay on that food, don't deviate from it because otherwise you're asking for the problem to come back again. Most of the time that doesn't fix the problem. And when I say most of the time, I'm talking like 98, 99% of the time it seems like in our practice. There is another concept that's much more difficult to kind of play out perfectly, but it would be this concept of inflammation in the body is cumulative, can be synergistic. And so when we have a situation where we have an allergy, that's a spilling over that inflammatory cup, if you will. And we don't wanna have extra things in that cup. So for instance, if you had an allergic dog and they're um, you know, out in the environment in Southern California, we ideally want them on flea control so that they are not getting continuous, continuous bites by fleas that could potentially increase their itch. You wanna control what you can control out of that cup. You could certainly try to feed a different diet and hope that that diet was less inflammatory and that is where kind of the rub is. Um, we don't know entirely like how that works and what food would be better for that particular dog. So again, we're kind of back to a food trial and seeing if it actually helps at all. If we find that there's something that helps, keep doing that. If we find that the problem continues to keep coming back, then obviously we're moving in a different direction now. So that basically is the, the list of all of the food uh, related issues and the two other things that the human um, allergy stories bring with them. All of that is kind of preamble to what we think is really going on with most of these pets. Most of these dogs are gonna have atopic dermatitis. Atopic dermatitis is a genetic issue in dogs. Um, it's a problem in people as well. Um, the most similar thing to it that you might know about is severe eczema of the hands and feet in people. Um, that is a problem that is very unfortunate for those that have it, and many of those people end up on real medications or biologics to manage their condition. Um, it's uncommon for us to get um, you know, a lot of benefit from doing this or that um, homeopathic or natural remedy, 
but you know that sometimes we have mild cases that can improve there on the dog side the problem with this being a genetic issue is that you cannot remove it uh, there is no gene therapy that we have yet for dogs to change their genetic makeup hopefully someday that's actually a thing but at this point it's not and so what we're dealt with is a diagnosis of a problem that we expect to be ongoing um, every dog is different, every day is different, every season is different, so we don't really have the ability to truly project in a linear way, you know, your dog is going to have this many vet visits over time, and uh, there's a severity issue as well that is hard to really know until we're, you know, experiencing it, but um, it's a spectrum disorder, so there are mild cases and there are severe cases, and sometimes they kind of move around a little bit. But atopic dermatitis being an ongoing problem is difficult because there is no solution to it. Um, there are remedies that we can use to manage the issue, but we do not have the ability to completely cure the problem. Um, we then, you know, start talking about atopic dermatitis. And so um, what that is going to play out like is your dog is going to be inhaling their allergens. Um, so it's not contact based. They're going to be breathing in their allergens. Um, they're going to be breathing in um, pollen, house dust mites, human dander, and mold. And it's that world that we all live around, that every single dog is breathing this stuff in every single day, regardless of where they live. Um, they're going to be inside the home breathing in pollen every single day, um, potentially even every single breath. They mount an inflammatory response to those things inside their body and send that inflammation to very predictable spots. It's basically where they have holes or fake holes. Um, so their set of symptoms are go going to vary from dog to dog again, and sometimes they vary from year to year as well, where you have a dog that has an ear infection one year, and then next year it's going to be a skin infection, um, or there's just itchiness at the paws, etc. So these are some of the areas and some of the ways that your dog could potentially play out itchiness. Um, she might be itchy around her eyes and do this kind of thing with her front paws, um, rubbing her eyes um, along bedding, things like that would also be potentially possible. Um, itchiness at the muzzle is pretty common, so they kind of do this thing or thump, thump, thump with their back leg. Frequently, again, they're going to be rubbing their muzzle along the couch, carpet, bedding. Um, they tend to get ear infections, so shaking the head, pawing at the ears. Um, frequently, we'll get a secondary ear infection there, which is going to be discharge odor, um, inflammation. Uh, sometimes it's hard to see that unless you're actually going down in the canal, but um, frequently your allergic dogs are going to get an ear infection. They tend to lick their feet. Sometimes they bite their paws. Sometimes they corn comb their lower extremities like a and they can be itchy in their armpits. They can be itchy in their groin. They can be itchy around their genitals as well. So if you have a male dog um, scooting or licking of the anus or a female dog, the anus and also the vulva potentially being involved as well. Um, that's one of our main reasons why dogs actually scoot their bottoms. It's generally not an anal sac or anal gland issue. Most of the time it's allergies. <clears throat> they can also be itchy on their back. And if they're itchy on their back, they're kind of gonna do this roll around thing on the ground um, or they rub their back up against the couch corner or the corner of a wall. And those are all of the different ways that uh, itchiness tends to play out for our dogs with atopic dermatitis. And then we get to um, treatment. So they're, they're unfortunately, again, there's no avoiding this. Um, doesn't matter how you house your dog, they're still gonna get exposure to allergens. And it also is not something that you can cure. So they basically are gonna go about their day and get exposed however they're gonna get exposed. And then it's up to their immune system to hopefully not overreact. But most of these dogs are overreacting. So they're gonna have the symptoms playing out. And um, basically, a big picture item here is probably the one thing that you absolutely must take home from this message is your dog, as an allergic dog, needs to stay within the guardrails every day. So this is my kind of concept on this. Um, we need to have an itch level that's very, very low. It should be less than a three out of 10 on a zero to 10 scale that you subjectively do as best you can. There's some references online that we can um, link up with this conversation. Um, but um, finding a, a level of itch indicator and an explanation for that online is relatively easy. We want it to be very, very low, less than a three out of 10. The other guardrail is skin infections or ear infections or both. Um, we don't want either of those things to exist. When your dog is breaking out of either guardrail or bro both, you need to bring your dog to the vet. And when the dog comes to the vet, um, we are going to evaluate them, we're going to identify their secondary problem and treat it, and we're going to do some kind of remedy to decrease the itch if that's appropriate. Occasionally we'll have a dog come in with an ear infection that the owner says is not really an itchy dog, 
And in that situation, we'll just treat the ear infection and see how things go with the itch. Um, occasionally, it's the other way around where we just have an itchy dog and no um, secondary problems at all. And then we're just managing itch. But either way, we need to do whatever it is that we stay within that guardrail. So oftentimes that is an itch remedy of some sort and treating the secondary problems. Um, we have four different options in management of this condition. We typically at Alicia Pet Care Center will go at it in this direction. First, we choose Cytopoint. Um, Cytopoint is an injectable treatment that I'll go into detail with in just a second. Second option usually is Apoquel, which is a pill. That's an immune modulating drug that's relatively well tolerated. Third choice is Atopica or Atopica. Um, that is yet another pill medication that's an immune modulating drug. And then the fourth option is allergy testing and shots. So I'll go through these things individually. As I said, most of the time we'll start with Cytopoint. Um, there's a caveat here. If we have a dog that's really, really inflamed when they're coming in, they're kind of a mess. They have a skin infection, they have an ear infection, they have a lot of inflammation associated with their issue. We don't get a lot of anti-inflammatory effects out of Cytopoint, so that may move us to Apoquel right off the bat or even cortisone as a short-term thing. But most of the time we're gonna just try to reduce the itch. Cytopoint is that lovely tool in our toolbox for this. Um, it is a unique treatment. It's not technically a medication, it's a biologic. Um, biologic means that it's an antibody against something. And this particular one is an antibody against interleukin-31. Interleukin-31 is a small speck of the immune system. Um, think of it as the itch protein. So if you take a normal dog and you give them a bunch of interleukin-31, suddenly they're gonna be ma massively itchy right off the bat. Itch is not so simple that we can blame it all on interleukin-31. It's a little bit more complicated than that. That's part of the reason why we don't have 100% success rate with that treatment. But success rate's about 80%, and it looks like this. If your dog came in and she's a five out of 10 on the itch scale, and we give a side point today, within two to three days, it, um, typically that itch level will come down close to zero and stay like that for an entire month. It doesn't last forever, because what's happening here is we're painting that interleukin-31 for removal. The immune system actually takes it out of, uh, out of the system um, and the immune system is also constantly, or the body is constantly producing it so it comes back online and that's why the injections typically only last for one to two months. This interleukin-31 is gonna come back to the normal level and we'll potentially have to do it again. Um, again, back to the guardrail concept. So if you are doing Cytopoint and you get a good response and we're nearly zero for 30 to 60 days, when it starts to unwind, you're gonna to start to see that itch level come back up. You're gonna be hopefully watching that very closely. Being a really good observant reporter is what we want you to do at home as a pet parent. And you're gonna eventually say, okay, this itch level is back again at that three out of 10. We're at that actionable level now. And I'm gonna call down to the vet and see if I can get in for a site appointment as a technician appointment soon. And you go on to the next Cytopoint injection. So that's a really great way to manage them. Um, Cytopoint, uh, as I mentioned, uh, has an 80% success rate, 20% uh, failure rate. Failure can look lots of different ways. Doesn't work at all, doesn't work fast enough, doesn't work well enough, doesn't last long enough and then that uh, very inflamed dog is also not gonna get a lot of anti-inflammatory benefits out of the Cytopoint. We don't really have concerns about side effects or drug interactions with this treatment. It's very, very clean. Um, so that's something that really um, speaks to a lot of people as well if they're you know, having some degree of concern about medication, side effects, and things like that. <clears throat> Second option, so if we didn't have good results with Cytopoint, um, we can move on to Apoquel. And Apoquel is a very well-tolerated uh, medication that a lot of dogs take across the country. And uh, that has about a 70% success rate on maintenance dosing. Um, usually everybody gets better the first two weeks because we're, we're generally giving them a higher dose for the first two weeks. And then after that, when we move to once a day dosing, it typically falls back to about a 70% success rate. Um, sometimes that's combined with Cytopoint. If we have a situation where we have some degree of improvement with both of those treatments, we can combine them together without any negative consequence. Um, but Apoquel is relatively simple. We don't have a lot of um, concerns about long-term side effects, even though initially we were concerned when this launched, you know, 13, 14 years ago, I think, um, that maybe we would impact the immune system's ability to function. Um, or maybe even increase the cancer risk for dogs. That's really not something that's played out. Um, we've been really carefully watching this, not just us at this animal hospital, but everybody across the country has kind of been uh, uh, waiting for these things to show up and they've really never shown up. So um, very well tolerated medication. 
Um, the third option is a Topica. So if you're finding yourself in this situation, that means that Cytopoint's already failed. Maybe you did a food trial, that didn't work. You've potentially gone out on your own, tried to do you know, some kind of additional um, you know, healthy approach and um, an Apoquel failed. And now we're looking at um, you know, using another tool in the toolbox because those other options didn't work. Um, Atopica is a very um, good medication, actually. It works very well. We have a relatively high success rate with it. It was the only game in town um, before Apoquel and Cytopoint showed up. And so we had a good like seven or eight years of just uh, Atopica maybe even 10. So I have a lot of cases under my belt because I'm kind of old now as a veterinarian, but um, a lot of experience with this. We do have some side effects associated with Atopica and we have some kind of like weird glitchy things uh, associated with that treatment. I'll go into them briefly here. Um, one negative consequence of using Atopica is that it is a very long half-life drug. It takes a very long time to build up in the system to actually be helpful for the individual patient. That ends up being about six to eight weeks of therapy that you need to do consistently before you're gonna see the results. It's not like Apoquel Cytopoint where we're gonna see the results within two to three days. It takes a long time to get there. So there's no short-term benefit of Atopica. It's really just a long-term drug and um, that can be one of the challenging things. Additionally, if it's um, dosed the way the manufacturer recommends, which is on an empty stomach, you have probably a 50% chance of having vomiting associated with many of the initial doses for the first three weeks or so. Um, if you dose it like we recommend, which is about 45 minutes after a meal, you're gonna cut your vomiting risk down to about 5%. If we do have vomiting, the reason why the vomiting happens in the first three weeks or so of the, the treatment is because the carrier of the medication in the capsule is an oil. And it's kind of like castor oil, um, if you've you know, got an old enough person that, you, that can tell you about how castor oil works and whatnot. It's very irritating to the stomach. Um, it causes nausea. It's a gastric irritant. And um, if you were to take castor oil on a daily basis, again, your stomach would get used to that and it would just stop happening. Same way with Atopica, usually after about three weeks, if there was nausea going on, that nausea just magically goes away and doesn't come back. We really never have to worry about that again. We're kind of beyond that nausea phase when we're in you know, a month or five, uh, four or five weeks out on the initiation of the treatment. We do see though that there's a chance of having um, soft stool or even intermittent diarrhea with that drug. Um, that can be an ongoing thing and it's about a 20% risk factor, I would say. It's probably about a 30 to 40% risk factor for your dog to develop excessive gum tissue growth. Um, which is called gingival, gingival hyperplasia, which sounds very scary, but it's a relatively mild side effect, even though it has this weird scary name associated with it. It usually doesn't cause dogs to have really any clinical problems. Um, they just have excessive gum tissue growth, and occasionally that becomes an issue that we will address under an anesthetic dental and just cut some of that gum tissue back. Um, I think probably every animal hospital has a very small number of atopica, um, patients that are in their practice group and that's definitely the way that our practice has morphed over the years. Most of our patients are going to be on Cytopoint or Apoquel now. Um, so that's Atopica and then allergy testing and shots. Um, it's, um, it's kind of an interesting thing but we just don't have a lot of great success cases. They are um, out there. They do exist but basically what ends up happening is for the most part, um, most everybody's gonna do uh, allergy testing with a blood test. Um, you can do an actual skin test where you're injecting the allergens underneath the skin. That's really a dermatologist thing. Um, so we'll talk about the non-dermatologist world. Um, most everybody does serum testing, which is a blood test. And the blood is drawn, sent off to the lab, and then they do a series of tests associated with that blood um, to give us uh, different allergens that we know the pet is allergic to. That doesn't change anything. So just knowing what the allergy is due to has no benefit. But um, the benefit comes not from avoidance because you're not gonna be able to avoid the dog, you know, breathing in eucalyptus or sage or ragweed or whatever the issue is. Um, you're not gonna stop that inhalation because there's nothing that generally you can do about your environment unless there's a wool allergy and you can take all the wool out of your house. But even that, that's probably just gonna be one of several allergens. So what it allows for us to do actually is for us to um, uh, desensitize the dog 
um, using hyposensitization therapy. That's a hard word to say. Um, but basically, we're going to trick the immune system by giving it a very, very, very tiny amount of what the allergy is due to and gradually increasing that amount so that the immune system initially is like, mm, I don't really care. There's like, you know, two specks of uh, sage in this uh, injection. That's really not going to set me off. And then um, the next time that there's an injection, now there's four specks of it and then eight and then 16. And gradually the immune system just gets basically kind of lulled into complacency and no longer mounts an inflammatory response against those individual allergens. That's how it's supposed to work um, at the end of the day with a one year commitment to doing this because we sometimes have cases that will not improve until close to that one year mark. Um, we have about a 30% excellent success group. We have a 20% group that's meh, so there's a little bit of help, but not so much that we can avoid doing other treatments, and then 50% have no benefit. So in our mind, we're really looking at like a 70% failure group and a 30% success group. Um, so generally, that just doesn't meet the mark in us being pragmatic, results-oriented veterinarians at this practice, and we're gonna choose something that's gonna get you results um, much faster than that or more reliably than that. But those are the treatments. Um, generally, again, it's going to be Cytopoint and cleaning up the skin infection, ear infection situation. Okay, so that basically is everything in a very big nutshell. This is a complicated issue, as you see. But I wanted to just end with a discussion about one of my allergy patients that's been kind of challenging for us. Not overly so, but Molly is a little West Highland White Terrier, and she is... Um, a dog that's had um, itchiness to some extent for a couple years, but the owners didn't entirely understand what they were seeing. They would see her lick her paws. They thought that it was, you know, a kind of grooming behavior that they were seeing. Eventually she came in and we saw her in physical exam with her white fur and her rust colored paws that was because she was excessively licking her feet. Um, she happened to hear, have an ear infection at that time and so we had a conversation with them about the allergy issues. And after, after they heard the, this conversation, basically, they were shocked and you know, somewhat feeling embarrassed that they hadn't really recognized the itch behavior that she had been playing out for many months. So we treated her ear infection, got that under control. We gave her some anti-itch medication, which actually worked initially. Um, but sometimes the way that it works with Cytopoint is that uh, it doesn't work forever. And sometimes what happens there is that the dogs develop an antibody to the antibody and then the antibody doesn't work anymore because the dog's own immune system is kind of attacking that antibody. Um, but somewhere, somehow, this dog's cytopoint just stopped working after about six months. In that situation, we, we went to Apoquel and Apoquel is a much better response um, for this dog long term, we were able to get her, you know, successfully put onto a um, maintenance regime of a once a day Apoquel. Um, this is after, by the way, the owners had um, tried to use, um, in between the Cytopoint and the Apoquel, they tried to use various bathing techniques. Um, they were using coconut oil, putting them on the paws. Um, they had even used uh, an omega 3 fatty acid supplement. And all of those things were you know, maybe improving things two to 3%, but really not a, a large amount. We ended up putting her on a high strength omega-3 fatty acid supplement that is greenlit muscle based called Moxor, which did help significantly, but not enough to allow for her to avoid going on an actual pharmaceutical. So again, Apoquel is this dog's friend. Um, we have not had ear infections be recurrent on her now. She's been on Apoquel for over a year and has been doing really, really well and hasn't come back in with ear infections. So we're gonna take that as a win. Um, owners are really happy with how things are going. Dogs tolerating the Apoquel well and it's working. So that is um, you know, hopefully something that uh, you can understand all of this very complicated uh, information that I'm throwing at you today. This is a really common issue. So again, odds are if you're watching this video, you do have a dog that has allergies. And just remember the, the overarching concept here of the guardrail thing. Um, we need to have the itch level to be very, very low, less than a three out of 10. If it's above a three out of 10, you should be advocating for your dog to get some kind of itch mitigator, itch relief. 
one way or the other, um, whether that's Cytopoint or Apoquel or even a short-term cortisone kind of situation. And then the other guardrail is skin infections or ear infections or both. It's important to kind of keep an eye on the ears and to smell the ears occasionally. Um, you could even put a Q-tip down in the canal a little bit and just get a sample of the ear debris. Take a little sniff test of that. It shouldn't smell bad. If you're getting stuff out of the ears, by the way, it's like nine out of 10 chance that your dog has an ear infection. And a skin infection's not gonna necessarily seem like a skin infection to you, but a rash, hair loss, scabs, bumpy stuff, itchiness in the zone. So if you're scratching this area that looks a little bit weird and the dog is going crazy and like, you know, you're hitting the spot, that's generally gonna be a skin infection as well. So those things need to be dealt with at the vet. Um, they're gonna be giving you some kind of medication to um, help your dog get through this issue. And hopefully with all of this information, you're now armed. And again, your role is observe and report. Um, so we don't need you to, you know, find a new treatment for this that, that you know, nobody's discovered yet. Um, but leave it to the professionals to give you guidance and help and do um, advocate for your pet's own well-being by trying to recognize that this long-term problem that's happening uh, to some extent every single day does probably need a long-term solution. So we can't solve a genetic problem with one treatment. Um, it's very expected for you to use a medication and if you stop using the medication, the problem is going to come back because we are not curing the medicine or curing the problem. So that's really important for you to recognize. Um, it really does probably require ongoing treatment to manage the vast majority of our allergic dogs. And I hope that this has been really helpful for you. If you have a question or uh, you have comments, definitely hit us up here. And um, if you're in the area, of course, we'd love to see you and um, we have eight other wonderful doctors here that are um, very up to speed on the current approaches for all of our skin problems in dogs and cats. So um, we would be happy to help you as our new client. Okay, thank you. Have a good day. When we got something to say, we go to where the cats play. Come hang with us for a while. We promise to make you smile. Chats!